In this video, we're going to discuss how to construct MO diagrams from fragment molecular orbitals. We're also going to talk about the concept of pi separability from the sigma framework. Up to now, we've been constructing molecular orbital diagrams in one of two ways. We've either been taking atomic orbitals from two atoms and combining, or we've been taking atomic orbitals plus ligand group orbitals and combining them into MOs. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to generate so-called fragment molecular orbitals using the two above methods, and then we're going to combine those together into molecular orbitals for the molecule as a whole. The molecule we're going to be generating a molecular orbital diagram for is ethene. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be considering the molecule and breaking this down into symmetry-related fragments. And there's a number of different ways in which we can approach constructing the molecular orbital diagram from fragment molecular orbitals. One way might involve taking the CC double bonded portion and constructing MOs from that from atomic orbitals of carbon and combining these with SALCs generated from the four hydrogen 1s orbitals in D2H symmetry. The procedure that we're going to use is going to involve breaking the CC bond down the middle and generating MO diagrams for two CH groups and combining these together generating the molecular orbital diagram for ethene. So what we're going to do is first generate MOs in C2V symmetry using carbon atomic orbitals plus the two hydrogen 1s salcs and then two combining those fragments. We're now going to go through and generate our CH2 molecular orbital fragment. This is going to look similar to the molecular orbital diagram we generated for water in a previous video. We're going to have our carbon 2p orbitals. These go with A1, B1, and B2 symmetry. And the carbon 2s, which goes as A1 symmetry. We're going to have our two salcs generated from the hydrogens, which have B2 symmetry and A1 symmetry. We're going to form a bonding and antibonding combination with the A1 on the carbon two, from the carbon 2S and the A1 from the 2H salc. There's also going to be a bonding combination formed using this A1 orbital, the 2PZ orbital from carbon, also overlapping with this. So we're going to get mixing into that, generating a higher energy bonding A1. We're going to generate bonding and antibonding combination from the B2 on carbon, the 2PY atomic orbital, and the B2 salc.
And finally, we're gonna have the B1 on carbon, the 2px, coming across as a non-bonding orbital. So going through and numbering these, one, two, three, one, two, and one. I'm just gonna go through and sketch out what a few of these look like. So the one, A1, which is primarily a 2s with the A1 salc, is gonna look something like that. The 1b2, it's gonna look something like that. The 2a1, is gonna look something like that. And the one B1, just reorienting this and drawing it so that this is going back and this is coming to the front as opposed to looking at it top down, is gonna look like that. For completeness, I'm also gonna place in electrons. We have six electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So for this MO fragment, this will be our highest occupied molecular orbital, assuming that it's a singlet ground state. And this will be our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. When we go through and combine these fragments, we're gonna consider a few things. Number one is the relative energies of these various MO fragments. And the second thing is the overlap that you would get between the MO fragments as you bring them together. So for example, your 1A1 and 1B2 are constrained back towards the hydrogen atoms. So they're not directly pointed towards one another. Because of this, there's gonna be small overlap. So they're going to be minimally influencing each other as they come in and make bonding and antibonding combinations. In contrast, if we look at the 2a1 and the 1b1 orbitals, these are primarily localized on the carbon atom and we're making a cc bond. Furthermore, with the 2a1, this is oriented along where we're gonna bring that other CH2 fragment. So these are gonna have large overlaps and will be strongly interacting as we generate the MO diagram for ethene. Now we're gonna be bringing those two CH2 fragments together to form ethene. I've gone through and I've placed the appropriate MO fragments on each side, and we're gonna bring those together. And before we do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider the energies. There's a large energy difference between these orbitals here, and these orbitals here, and these orbitals here, and these orbitals here. So I'm gonna put in these hash marks just to signify that. What the consequence of that is gonna be is that this A1 here isn't gonna mix in to any great extent with that A1 there, so we can ignore mixing. These orbitals down here are pointed away from the carbon-carbon bond, so therefore these orbitals aren't going to strongly perturb one another when we bring them in and mix them together. In other words, there's gonna be minimal orbital overlap between the B2 and the B2, for example. And you can see this just by sketching out what this would look like. So the B2 orbital looks something like this, where we have the carbon here and then the two hydrogens there. And when we bring two of those together,
there's going to be minimal overlap of the orbitals because the orbitals are oriented in this direction. The same thing is going to apply for that A1. So we're going to make still bonding and antibonding combinations with those, but they're going to be minimally perturbed from the starting point energetically. Ethene is in D2H symmetry, so we have to change our symmetry labels. So this is going to have an AG symmetry label. This will have a B1U. Next one up is going to have a B2U symmetry label. And then we're going to have a B3G symmetry label. I'll be plotting these molecular orbitals on the next slide just so you can see what they look like and go through and verify that these are the symmetry labels for those molecular orbitals. The high line MO fragments are going to combine in a similar manner. So going through and labeling these for completeness. We have that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to consider these combinations in here. With these, these are going to be strongly interacting. And we can see this as if we look at the A1 combinations. So as we said, that molecular orbital fragment looks something like that with your carbon here and your hydrogens here and here. We have another fragment that's going to be coming in and binding in that manner. But now as these come and bind in, these two lobes are going to be strongly overlapping. So we're going to make a bonding and an anti-bonding fragment. These have AG and B1U symmetry. The B1s are also going to combine. They're going to be more strongly interacting than we had with the lower line orbitals, but not quite as strongly interacting as this A1 fragment. So these interactions, we have these coming in in a pi type fashion. And pi interactions are less strongly interacting than sigma type interactions. So as these come and combine, they're going to be interacting more strongly than these low-line orbitals down here, but not quite as strongly interacting as we have here. So what we're going to get is bonding and an anti-bonding combination. And these have B3U and B2G symmetry. Putting electrons into these orbitals we get this. So this B3U here is the HOMO and this B2G is our LUMO. I've gone through and replotted the MO diagram for ethene. I'm going to point out a few features about this. So the first is that these orbitals down here are considerably lower in energy than that 2AG orbital is. So the energy separation between the 2AG and the 1B3G is on the order of four 
electron volts. Furthermore, the 1B3U homo and the 2AG homo minus 1 has another approximately 3 eV energy separation. So the 1B3U is energetically activated considerably more than the 2AGs. Furthermore, these orbitals that are low in energy that are mostly involved in carbon-hydrogen bonding are deeply buried. The ones that we have in the middle energy region, the 2AG through the 2B1U, are the results of carbon-carbon bonding. And we can see this as we go through and plot out what these molecular orbitals look like. These are the molecular orbital diagrams that are the result of a high-level electronic structure calculation. And these fare out what we've gone through and derived from a simple MO diagram using this fragment molecular orbital approach. These low energy orbitals down here are all involved in CH bonding and they're buried fairly low in energy. These higher line orbitals are involved in carbon-carbon bonding. The A2G, which is our HOMO minus 1, the orbital that's 1 below the HOMO, is involved in a carbon-carbon sigma bond. So this is the CC sigma bond. The HOMO is involved in a carbon-carbon pi type bond. So this is the molecular orbital that's responsible for the pi bond. The 1B2G which is our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, is sometimes called the pi star orbital because it's the antibonding combination of the two p orbitals that are involved in forming that carbon-carbon pi bond. Much of the chemistry of alkenes is rationalized in terms of just considering the carbon-carbon double bond, so that pi bond, which is described using your homo and your lumo. This is justified because these are your energetically accessible orbitals. The HOMO and the LUMO are your frontier molecular orbitals. Those are the ones which are energetically available to participate in chemical reactions. They're your chemically active molecular orbitals. In such a frontier molecular orbital analysis, you mostly ignore these low-lying orbitals as they're not going to be dictating the chemistry that you would observe. It's only your frontier molecular orbitals that are going to be largely dictating that chemistry. Another aspect of this is that this pi bond and this sigma bond can be separable in terms of chemical reactivity. We describe the chemistry as occurring on that pi bond, not in the CC sigma bond. And this concept of chemical separability of molecular orbitals is an important approximation that's used throughout chemistry. In fact, Huckel MO theory, which describes organic pi systems so well, is predicated on the concept of pi sigma separability. If the pi system couldn't be separated from the sigma framework, Huckel MO theory would completely fail.